All right, so uh, our next speaker, uh, uh, if you have any that, an opportunity to get your lunch, uh, run out and do so and get back. I'll, I'll follow you in a moment here. Um, our next speaker is Thomas Robinson. Uh, and, you know, really foresters and natural resource professionals are very good about talking about uh, all these different uses for forests, but really what we need is to have more people who are putting into practice the opportunities uh, for good forest management. And so we're fortunate to have Thomas Robinson here, who is actually kind of at that nexus, really, between talking about the benefits of forest and finding new and exciting use for forests and forest products. So it's, it's great to have Thomas here talking about these new uh, processes we've seen for tall buildings uh, and cross-laminated timber and the like. Thomas looks at the architectural approaches uh, to use forest and material innovation in ways that we have not seen uh, uh, for a long time. Lever Architecture, his 16-person practice, uh, which he founded in 2009, is pioneering in the use of cross-laminated timber, or CLT as it's called, in the U.S. Uh, in general. And this is a project, really, uh, that's going to be lead to a number, hopefully, of large uh, mass timber high-rises in the U.S., and it was the recipient of the U.S. Tallwood Building Prize competition. Uh, he's also done various other projects. Uh, these include the Albina Yard, the first building U.S. made from domestically uh, fabricated CLT. Uh, we have com competition to the north. Student housing for the Pacific Northwest College of Art in the Angelo Estate Winery. His firm recently received the Architectural League of New York's Emerging Voices Award and has been recognized for design excellence by the AIA chapters in Portland, the Northwest region, and Los Angeles. He received a Bachelor of Arts degree in architecture from the University of California, Berkeley, and a Master in Architecture with distinction from the Harvard Graduate School of Design. So please let, uh, help me welcome Thomas so very much. So I, I think I can move this up here, or is it to click it? Okay. Can I move this on the screen? I can try. Is it ever remote? Anyone? You know what? I, I can reach. <laughs> if, I can I can make it work. Oh, if you can make that if you can make that work, great. We'll see you. Um, thank you, thank you um, for the invitation. It's really a great honor to be here this afternoon um, with uh, um, everyone that's come before. And and I was uh, got that. It was um, I you know I was thinking about what I was going to say, but I was actually really inspired by um, you know Congressman Westerman and Senator Rich and the panel. Um, when, when, especially when Congressman Westerman said, what, is, um, what can a forester do in Congress? You know, and, and, and I was thinking, what is an architect doing here at this, um, at this convention, at this, at this meeting? And I think, and, and when I was thinking about it, what we really can do is um, talk about the market, because I think that was something that brought up, because we're, what we're really interested in is um, connecting, uh, the resources that are in our region to our and the the um, sort of rural economic development to the explosive growth that we're experiencing in our cities, like Portland and a lot of cities throughout the United States. So that's something that I want to talk about today is really um, our projects within that framework, really connecting um, uh, rural economic development to urban growth and also to issues of stewardship and to sustainability. And this is. Um, the 12-story project um, that was the winner of the U.S. Tallwood Building Prize. This was sponsored um, uh, by the USDA and the Softwood Lumber Board, sort of a joint uh, public-private um, venture to really pay, in a way, for the research needed to do a tallwood building. I'm going to talk about really what that means, because that's quite a challenge, and I, I think that that combination of the private and public sector is really critical to this effort. And, you know, I'm, I'm from Oregon now, but I'm actually back in my native city. I was actually born in Washington, D.C. <laughs> um, but I haven't really been, spent any time here since like 1978. <laughs> but I still think that that connection is important, the kind of 
the bi-coastal kind of connections. And now as I start to travel throughout the United States, even connecting to the south, but this is the forests in Oregon, in a way, define our state. They're really the economic engine of Oregon, but they're also really the thing that draws people to Oregon. It's the beauty, it's the experience of being in the forest, which I would say defines our state in, on many levels. And I, I like this, uh, this map uh, where you can see Portland here, and we have our little sort of dense forest, and then here, you know, and then everyone else in the room is sort of talking about that. Um, and I think that. Uh, that, but that connection between our cities and uh, our um, rural resources is really critical. That truck that you just saw go across the screen left D.R. Johnson's um, plant in southern Oregon, three hours south from Portland, at 9 a.m. It got to our site. This is where my office is located in Portland in, uh, at around noon, and by... 12.31 p.m., we'd laid 4,000 square feet of flooring. So basically, that was just one floor on a semi that drove up the I-5. Um, and I think that kind of, that kind of connection, um, you know, I remember when we were talking about doing this building, they were just about to get their APA certification for their panels. And she said, well, how are we, how are we gonna get it there? And she's like, oh, you can use our truck. We have got, we've got one semi, we'll let you use it. Um, as opposed to getting a truck and coming. That was really the connection that was made on this project. And what's interesting about this project is I almost, it's the first, as far as we know, domestically fabricated cross-laminated timber glue lamp building where it's a full structural system um, in the United States. And we, um, you can sort of see how it's going together here. Uh, Everything um, in this building, it, it's really um, being done in Portland for the first time, basically laying up a building with CLT, designing the connectors. All the, um, the elements that you see here were um, machined either in southern Oregon or in Portland. And once we actually got off to the, you know, out of the ground, out of the concrete, everything was to, to the eighth of an inch. And if anyone's a contractor here in the room has built things, you gotta understand that kind of level of precision on a 55 foot tall wood frame. And that's the kind of thing we're talking about. It's, it's a new way of thinking about building. It's a new level of precision. I always kind of try to make the analogy, if you think of uh, a very large Ikea cabinet, uh, but when you think about an Ikea cabinet, there's a huge amount of technology that goes into that particular piece, that little cheap shelf that you're getting they're, they're basically engineering every little steel connection they're putting together. And the, also with an Ikea cabinet, if one piece isn't actually done correctly, the whole thing doesn't fit together. And so I think that's important to understand. It's an important mindset to sort of change on, on the end. And I think that's something that even we've had to really work with our um, Goulin manufacturers to really explain to them the kind of precision that we need. So, I like this, that was the, that's, so that's our office. We're on the top floor and the second floor. This is, that's what I'm sort of sitting out there in the front. But I think that we're um, a 20 person, now a 20 person office in Portland. And we're very um, interested in uh, how we can show that architecture has value in our, in our community. And when you talk about, uh, when people were talking here about how you can demonstrate how forestry has value, I think architecture and forestry are sort of similar because I think people don't necessarily know what it is that we do. We're kind of a small group. Um, and I was sort of thinking of the affinities there. Uh, and there's a lot of education that goes into getting to that point. And I think that I'm really excited to actually sort of make the connection here on, on this level, because I've made the connection with the manufacturers, but actually on the forestry levels, just going a little bit deeper. And I think that's pretty exciting. But we, um, we've had probably like 1,000 people come through this building. And I think it's been a real touchstone because I've spoken at the um, Washington legislature and now I'm here um, in, you know, in the Congress. But I think that showing people that this can actually happen has had a really large impact on people um, throughout, I think, the US saying, hey, these guys are doing it in Portland. You don't want to let Portland beat you, you know, these little guys out there. <laughs> so I think that it's gotten things going and we're excited to be part of that and framework is really the next step. This slide um, I like because it really combines what I think is important. It, it combines this idea of jobs, 
It combines this idea of just a beautiful material and the fact that this um, panel is coming out of the same range that you see there in the distance. So that's where the wood's coming from and it's coming into the city. And I think that is super exciting for us and, and it really enables us to think we can create value. Portland, just a little bit about Portland. For those of you who might not have been there, I, I hadn't been there <laughs> until I moved there, and it's pretty far, a little far off the beaten path. But we're a, we're a city that's defined by its landscape. You know, our, our monuments are trees. You know, it's our park. We have the largest urban forests in a city in the United States, and we also are really defined by that, but we're also a really young city. You know, everything that you see here was built from 1850 on. So when we're working in Portland, we're really working on sites that are probably either the first or second generation of the city, so that's important to us. And then, uh, and people ask like, well, how did you get into um, architecture? Well, it really started with wood. This was actually my great-grandfather's house built in Cape Cod in 1928. And I, found, and I spent my summers going to this house, like maybe like people spent their summers going to the forest, and I was a big part of it too, but this was, I found out from my dad about five, six years ago that my great-grandfather bought a boxcar of Oregon pine um, and basically had it shipped to Cape Cod. And he had two Irish carpenters build it. And you can still see their fingerprints right there on this thing because it's all just built out of that one material. And it's beautiful and it's really the reason that I was interested in architecture. And I, I won't bore you with all the different permutations of how I got into architecture, but it was really only when I moved to Portland um, 13 years ago that I started to build with wood. And, and this was one of our first projects, was a project called Union Way, where we're basically taking two very long blocks and, and basically connecting them together across the street to create a new urban kind of passage. If those of you have been to Paris, there's these passages that kind of cut through the city, and this is sort of a northwest version of one. But it's, what's interesting about it is we were really thinking about how do we connect these two structures seamlessly, and the way we kind of did it is we actually looked around our region. And one of the things I was really interested in is there was a forest, uh, basically a farmed FSC certified forest about three hours outside of um, Portland, that if you drive into the gorge in Portland, you'll go by this very odd forest. You're like, what is that? I remember driving by it a couple times and I've asked a friend about it. He's like, oh yeah, that's a forest that's owned by Collinswood. You should talk to them. And so we ended up talking directly to Collins. I did, I kind of met with them. And then instead of actually going through a contractor, we actually um, contacted them, talked about what we wanted to do. We organized the, that wood being milled in Portland and then delivered to the site. So, it was, in a way, this, where the term forest to frame kind of, kind of got coined. And that's really, for those of you who know about food in Portland, you know, we have this idea of farm to table. But I think the fundamental idea is that you take that really amazing ingredient, whether it's wood or whether it's really ripe pears or whether it's this great, you know, barbecue that you have in another region of the country, and you think about how you can actually create an amazing experience out of it. And I think there's a really, there's things that we can learn from those types of um, experiences in, in food and in agriculture. And I think that's something that we're really interested in as we you know, get into what we're doing here. So we do a lot of other work that I'm not gonna show, but I wanted to show this one project. This is a renovation of a building in Los Angeles for um, a major entertainment company that you've all heard of. They make a lot of animated features. Uh, and one of the things about what we did in that was we basically reclaimed wood within the city of LA. So the same distance from this project um, to say the forest in Oregon, we actually reclaimed 12,000 square feet of wood from a high, high school gymnasium in Redondo Beach for a project in Burbank. Because LA is so big, it's almost there's resources within these urban environments that are wood resources that can be reclaimed it's almost, you know, and then you can actually harvest from within. And we're interested in both those types of things. Um, and I think um, we have an urban growth boundary, and it's a smaller city, so we have the forest right there. But there's a lot of wood. Look at the wood around you here, even in this building, that can be reused um, in, in those areas. So I'm showing this project because it's actually our tallest wood building to date. It's not Albany Yard. This is an 85-foot tall housing project built out of traditional stick frame. So people ask, 
you know, a lot of times, well, you guys are building a, you know, 150 foot tall wood building. Have you built any tall wood buildings? Well, that's actually all we do <laughs> in the Northwest is build tall wood buildings. We just can't build them over 85 feet. Um, and, and so we have a lot of institutional knowledge about how to do that, how to do it quickly, how to do it efficiently. There's really no way we can beat stick framing on price in the Northwest. So I think when people start saying, oh, CLT is going to replace stick, it's not entirely. There may be hybrids, but it's not going to do that. And, and I just think that's an important piece of the puzzle here. Uh, this project came out of our sort of work on the previous projects. So what we noticed was is on the, if, you, if you go to any stick frame building, which I don't, you don't have as many here, but I see some, you'll see the glue lamps are of a standard size. And that we make these by the mile in southern Oregon. And we're like, well, could we take that product and basically use it in a more sort of innovative way? So we were able to build all this roof, all the wooden is like fifteen, sixteen thousand dollars $16,000. So that gives you a sense of like the cost of wood in Oregon. And that's also a problem as well as an asset. But we were really interested in thinking about how that structure for a winery, um, this is a winery, you know, in Oregon, it's finished last year, but how do we create an architecture that's expressive of what's happening right now in Oregon, in wine, and really connecting those two things? So I'm going to go now, now that I've shown you a lot of stuff that you're like, what is he talking about? What does this have to do with tall wood? Um, I'm going to go right into the two kind of main projects. And I see these two projects as almost like, um, you know, uh, big brother, little sister. They're both super important. They're part of the same family. And we've learned a lot. Um, just maybe how parents learn a lot on their first kid, and then they're better on their second kid, I guess. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> but really, uh, um, this is sort of showing that process, which we've kind of coined as forest to frame, really thinking about, um, you know, we're up here, right? And, and kind of here, and maybe getting into here. And some of us here are getting into this, and then here, we're taking over. <laughs> and contractors, and designers, and millers, and then we're fabricating. And I think that whole, uh, you know, I guess the whole stick to stick uh, kind of analogy is, was something that we wanted to take on. And for us to actually, actually make these buildings, we had to take it on because nobody was going to connect all those dots. And that's really the role we've tried to play on this building, which is um, really not just about building a building out of. Uh, cross-laminated timber, well, what is the architecture of cross-laminated timber? And the building itself, you see these kind of, you know, architectural moves here where things, that is actually an expression of the structural capacity of wood. So um, what's great about cross-laminated timber is you can cantilever in two directions and you can cantilever four feet with a three-ply panel. So that's, that joint, that kind of expression is the, the maximum cantilever that we can do with a, with a four-ply panel. And you can sort of see it going up there. And you see that's the sort of maximum cantilever that we can do. And that's really, um, and also there's sort of the, th the thinness and the strength. It's four inches thick and it could cantilever four feet. It's an inch a foot. It's an incredibly light and incredibly strong. And, and we're really trying to work with that on this project. So um, people ask, well, how are you able to do what you were able to do first? And the way we were able to do that is we started with the supply chain. And now we're actually looking to start with a forest on our new projects. But really looking at, this was the press that Deer Johnson had actually um, decided to get going. And I, I, I think that there is a role for um, public funds in helping jumpstart these types of equations. We would not be here today if there had not been a grant by Oregon Best to Deer Johnson to build this press. None of this would be happening. And we would not be here today if the USDA hadn't actually put together the U.S. Tallwood Building Competition to incent the developers in Portland to do this project. There's, to jumpstart those pieces is key. And, and what we did with our project was said, well, this is the press. We want to build a building that wastes as little wood as possible. So we really organized the design of the building around the module of that press. Does that make sense? So that when you're building a big panel, if you cut a big chunk out of it, you're basically throwing that away or you, you, it becomes somebody's kitchen table, but that's not very realistic. Um, and then I think the other thing we really wanted to do is thinking about our weather. It rained the entire time that we built this building, so we had to really talk to our Canadian friends about, well, you need to powder coat all the connections, you need to do all these things so it doesn't end up to be a mess. 
So you can see I'm showing you the rainy days because basically we were squeegeeing water off this thing. <laughs> I think we used a leaf blower sometimes to just like blow the water off of it every day. But you know, the reality is, is no sanding, no treatment afterwards, just oxalic acid on the stained wood, which is, um, um, and that was because we used the powder coated connections and sort of had that and kind of did taping as we went up. So this gives you a sense, that's our conference room. And if you come out to Portland, please feel free to stop by. We've, we've had many people, <laughs> we can take more. Um, and this is our fire stair actually in the back. Uh, so that was really thinking about using it over there. And that's the owner, Aaron Blake, who was also happens to be the contractor. So this is where the, where the beams were cut in Portland. On, I think the, it used to be the largest hun digger west of the Mississippi, but that's changing quickly. And, um, and I, you know, I think that, I think what's interesting about what we were doing there is really trying to connect all these different people doing different things. And actually, I met the guy who owned that machine um, because I was flying to LA on a project and I met this crazy guy from Idaho who's doing uh, um, prefabricated houses. You've got to meet this guy, Stefan, and he ended up actually cutting all the stuff on our project. So this is sort of the way things are working. But I wanted to show you the connections that we developed for this because these were critical for our framework project. These were all fabricated locally um, and they address something that I'm going to talk about more. It's not a big deal on the East Coast, but it's seismic. So we're having to deal with seismic forces on our buildings and codes that nobody has had to deal with anywhere and have really taken that on honestly. So this was really addressing those kind of connections and you can sort of see it how it goes together. It's really dealing with what we call um, the drift requirements for our buildings that they have to be able to sort of drift and not fail. So this just shows you how those connections go together and then sort of what it looks like in place. So this is sort of the IKEA analogy. Basically, we you use the same tools, basically an electric screwdriver and then a crane. But that's pretty much what you need to put this thing together. There's no cutting on site at all. And then this is sort of the result. So framework, I'm gonna now, I say it's now for something really pretty completely different. So Albina Yard, no public assistance, no grants, market rate project. I'm actually as proud of the fact that that project was built, including all the mechanical and the carpets for $200 a square foot. So it was a very, um, that's, you know, it can be expensive in some parts, but in, in Oregon, that's not bad. And, you know, um, but framework is completely different because you're talking about a project that doesn't exist in the current code. So basically, you're, having to do all the testing in the fire, seismic, acoustics, um, everything, using a performance-based approach and really working with the code authority to say, hey, this is our plan, these are all the tests that we're gonna do, we're gonna show you that it works. I make the, you know, the, the performance-based approach, people think that's crazy, but you know, when NASA wants to build a tower to hold their rocket to launch it to the moon, they have to do a performance-based design approach. They're basically saying, this doesn't fit in the code, but you need to show the code authority that it's going to work. So we're basically using that same approach of showing either through computer modeling or through all these other things that it's going to work. So this is a good diagram I like to show just because here's Albany Yard, here's Framework, and here's like a former 600-year-old Douglas fir. We're not really kind of even at the capacity of those trees in terms of the weight they can bear. And really framework um, is in a way inspired by those old growth trees. This idea of a, of a heavy wood core that's flexible with the branches and then the canopy. And that's really sort of what kind of was one of the first ideas in the building. But I think this is an important thing to show because people say, oh, you're building these big buildings out of wood you're having to use old growth timber to do it or big pieces of wood to do it. And this, why I think Oregon is interesting and it's the reason I think in Portland that this is happening on many levels with Portland is we still have the, the kind of memory of these trees in our culture, it's still there. And, and basically these trees are now most of our buildings in our city and there's a real uh, 
kind of affinity for wood, where people, I bring in brokers, I bring in lawyers, and it's like, oh, my dad worked in a sawmill, and I love being in your building. It reminds him of that. But I think what we, we can't do this anymore. What we're doing is actually the opposite. We're looking at the sort of cellular um, and molecular comp makeup of wood, which has an incredibly strong strength to weight ratio, and taking that understanding and then binding it together in these new technologies, cross-laminated timber being one of them. By understanding how wood behaves at that level, that's really the heart of cross-laminated timber, the stability of it. It's also the heart of plywood. Um, what we're trying to do is create a stable product then, that we can then manufacture at that eighth inch tolerance, ship it to site and know it's gonna go together and it's not gonna go crazy when it rains. So this is sort of, at the heart of framework is this idea of it being a catalyst project. And this was the diagram that we submitted when we did our competition, where at the heart is this idea of Oregon um, economic, rural economic development. I think that's something that's been the thing that I think people across the country have been most interested in on one level, at least on the political level. <laughs> and that has then sort of, in our view, led to these other things that kind of circle around it, and I won't go through it, but how everything is connected and it's a cycle. Um, and we're really excited about, you know, obviously we're in Portland and we really want to think about that, but the more we get into this, the more we get into the forest. And in our next project, we're really looking at, well, how, where are we sourcing the wood and how does that connect to, you know, where we're, what we're building? And that's really interesting as well. So some of the, um, some of the things to kind of talk about on framework, uh, it's really what, what makes it special. Um, it would be the tallest mass timber building in the US. It's already the first tall mass timber building to be permitted in the history of the United States, so going over um, six stories, so 145 foot structure. So we had the permit, now it's been like three months. And now we're working on um, the final um, deferred submittals and also we have an interesting structure of the project that it's affordable housing offices and a retail bank on a tight urban site. So it's, a, it's not, we're, we're biting off a lot, and I think, but we're making great progress on it. It's also it would be the tallest post-tension rocking wall project in the world. I'll explain that a little later, but it's really addressing the fact in Portland, um, you know, we have earthquakes. I grew up in California, we have a lot of earthquakes there, and I've been, I, I don't know how many people here have been through major earthquakes, probably not that many, but uh, I've been through three or four, and. I'm really interested in seismic technology in terms of buildings. Um, so we'll talk about how that works. And then it would be the first high-rise building with exposed wood of any percentage in North America. So part of our culture is, is based on that experience that I talked about in my great-grandfather's house. We think that's an important market point within these types of buildings. People are building these buildings because they want to have that experience of wood. We have to find ways to expose it safely. Um, it's also the first project carrying out two-hour fire tests on CLT floor and wall assemblies in North America. And the, the kicker at the end is, and it's a little bit frightening for me, but all the test, re <laughs> test results and details will be made public in the spirit of that private-public um, partnership that what we're doing now should be used um, to, to promote further buildings of this type. So this is the basic structure um, that I talked about that post-tension um, uh, uh, cross-laminated timber um, shear wall system. That's what you're seeing here is eight shear walls. And if you imagine my arm as a big piece of wood, one of those, it's tensioned down the center, and it's not fixed at the base. So it can actually rock and then pull back to center. And, that's, and then you sort of see the, um, the, the gravity frame and then the um, CLT. This is some of the um, uh, nonlinear analysis tests where we would actually run the building through various earthquakes. This is highly exaggerated, so we can actually see how it's moving. And this is the system, this is this um, post-tension cross-laminated um, timber wall system uh, that's disconnected from the floor system. So it's what we call a resilient, low damage design. And what that means is that after a major earthquake, you may not, I don't know if there's structural engineers in the room, but most high rises in most cities on the West Coast will basically have to be torn down. Because they're designed not to fall, that's, but they're not designed necessarily to, to go back to, to center. 
And what this building does is it, it would be immediately occupiable after one of those major earthquakes. Even though there would be damage within it, it's actually designed to recenter. And that, some of the technology you're seeing here is that. So we're part of a NSF-funded uh, grant. This is the Nary Tall Wood Project um, out of the Colorado School of Mines, Lehigh University's involved in it. But this was uh, a test that was done about a month ago where they basically put the, many of the details that we developed on framework um, onto the shake table in San Diego. They put it through 10,000 years of earthquakes in five hours with almost no damage. So it's a pretty exciting uh, you know, kind of piece of it, and I think, so this is the rocking wall here, this is the post-tensioning, and these little things in here are called um, uh, U-shaped flexural plates, which actually slow the acceleration of the building. And then after an earthquake, those can actually be replaced. They're like fuses. If you think about a spoon, you bend it a couple times, it weakens, but that first bend actually, and that's really the only connection between these shear wall systems and the gravity frame. So there are two separate systems and are flexible in that way. So this is just showing you how that works. Um, a little bit about the program. Um, you know, no one is probably going to build another project exactly like Framework, but the idea is Framework will be a catalyst for these other projects. So we have office, five floors of creative office, and we have five floors of affordable 60% AMI housing. And then we have retail on the ground floor on a quarter block site. We could actually build higher structurally, the FAR on the site limits us to 90,000 square feet. So this is, we want a building that at the ground level speaks about its fact that it is a wood building. So that's a really essential part of it. And then there's an actual public space with an exhibit and cafe. And then the bank, there's a community development bank, um, uh, a beneficial state bank corp, which would occupy the ground floor and also the top two floors. This is the office level. And then this is the housing levels. So there's some stuff about it's more architecture, about the facade, and just the inspiration of the way the forest changes and the light changes on the building. Um, just more details on that. Some mock-ups for that. Uh, this, was, this was a model that was actually here in Washington, D.C. at the, you know, the, um, the building museum. And I think, I guess, Senator referred to it, and that was a really a point to having it here so that people here could actually see that exhibit, and I think it was very well received. So I, I'm going to just talk a little bit about where we're at right now. I just want to show you, this is the um, Navisworks model where every element of the building is modeled. So this is the actual computer model that our fabricator for the wood is using. Those are all the piles. These are all the um, sort of steel elements. This is the, um, the electrical vault, all the conduit and plumbing that going through, all the framing for the facade, and then the facade itself, then cutting the sections through it. So we basically spin this thing around and zoom into it, and we do clash detection to make sure every piece of conduit and piping goes exactly where it needs to go. So this is just a zoom in where we'd be spending hours on the phone with contractors to figure this out. So I'm going to end with sort of structural testing. I talked about the performance-based design. Um, so that means that we had to develop with the state of Oregon a kind of uh, performance-based path where, that was actually reviewed independently by a peer panel of experts, um, both for the structure and for the fire. So we set out this plan and we said, here's what we have in the current code, here's what's missing. We need you guys to review that. The state reviewed it and said, hey, we, we think this works. We also had an independent peer review of academics and professionals review that plan. And then we set about doing the testing to fill in the gaps. So this is the testing of the, um, that rocking wall system. Basically, that's the rocking wall laid on its side. That post-tensioning is what you're seeing there. And then what you see there is a 500 kip actuator. So that's about. 500,000 pounds, which is like 25 dump trucks in the area of like that. So basically, we're testing the capacity and the stiffness of that wall, because that's what we need to, need to be. It can't, it needs to work as one element over that entire speed. So this is like just showing the cycling. I think I have the hang of this now. Sorry. <laughs> the cycling of that as we're sort of putting more pressure on it, slowly going to 500 kips. We only need about 150, but obviously we want to take it farther. This is another um, 
This is the testing of the, um, the frame itself. So if it's a low damage design for the, the actual shear wall system, um, we also wanted to be, I need to be wanted low damage for the frame itself. But the trick with this is this had to also be able to, it, it got to a, uh, um, a drift that is three times what is code required with almost no damage. So typically code is 2% with a concrete structure. This got to 6%. Um, and then we did uh, acoustic testings of the floor assemblies, many different options in, in Pennsylvania. So this is a national effort. Um, that's some of the testing going on. We did fire testing in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, this is just, I, I think, I'm not, I think you guys are foresters, you know about the sort of inherent um, fire resistance of large timber. And I think the best way I can explain to people that aren't is, if you think about, if you put a really big log on the fire, um, it may not burn through. And when that log self-extinguishes, you try to relight that charred log, it's really hard. You almost like, let's put that away. <laughs> we'll start with a new one. So I think that's a way to understand the charring of large timber. And then what we needed to do was actually develop a detail where we're taking the steel and we're embedding it in the wood to protect it from the fire. It seems kind of counterintuitive, right? But that's really what we're trying to do. And we're trying to use as little steel as possible because steel is so strong, you don't need that much of it. And then we're basically developing these details um, to basically do the fire test. And this is, um, this is the, this is the two-hour fire test. It's very stressful. It's not that exciting, but you can sort of see here in the monitor the fire starting up. And there's, a, there's an actuator on top here. And this is over two hours, so obviously it's sped up. Uh, but you'll see sort of as it starts to get hotter and hotter. You can see, you can start to see that's the beam, which is there, and then there's the column there. So we're looking kind of up through a camera, and you can sort of see what's happening. So th this is the fr a first-in-world test. I don't, because in Europe it's 90 minutes for these types of connections, and we're here in the United States, when you get into a high-rise, it's two hours. And the reason for that, which I failed to say earlier, is to think of it just in terms of logic. How high is a, the tallest ladder truck going to go? It's about 85 feet, 75, 85 feet. After that height, you're fighting the fire from inside the building or from helicopters. So you need, you need a structure that could withstand. So this is after it came out after two hours. So that's that I was showing you there, and that's the column. Still tons of integrity left. Um, but pretty impressive just to see. This is, we did about 40 fire tests of different assemblies, not just of the wood itself, but actually testing how to protect it. So basically, one of the things that I think is really important on high-rise, what we're finding is in a high-rise wood building, you can only expose maybe 50% of the wood and meet that two-hour requirement. And I think that's something that I think is important to communicate to the public because I think there's a lot of people showing renderings, and, and I could say we might have done that as well. Of, of buildings where everything's wood. Well, wood actually is also fuel, so you have to account for that energy within the building structure. And I think it's important that people just understand that. So this is also wall tests. We knew that the 12-inch <laughs> wood walls would pass, but we had to test them anyways under load. And then, um, and then just to kind of wrap it up, I, I think that connection, you know, why is an architect here at you know, a Society of American Foresters Conference. Why is an architect actually, you know, even talking about these things at both state capitals and here in Washington? And I think it's really about that connection. And it's really about creating the market that will actually then drive more sustainable forest management. And uh, we're excited to be part of it and excited to get to know new people, you know, in that, in that sphere. So thank you. You guys haven't, I don't know if we have time for questions or not. I mean, I think, I think two things. Um, 
tenacity <laughs> is important. I mean, you know, even for us to do a building in Portland that has no wood in it requires a phenomenal amount of tenacity if you're working in the central city because of our design review and code review. And I, I you know, I own lots of buildings in California. You, you need to like stick with it in a nice way. Um, I think uh, I think in Oregon we have a little bit of an advantage um, in that um, the state is in a way the ultimate code authority, though they don't exercise it, they're very judicious about it. But given this particular building type and the newness of it, they said, well, let's we'll take that on for four projects that are pilot projects so that there isn't this kind of chaos, one city saying this and one city saying that. Because in the end, if there's ever a conflict, it always goes up to the state, and the state needs to actually make a ruling if there's issues at the city level. So that helped us, you know, kind of set the ground rules, you know, and saying, hey, we're really going to work with you. Everything's above board. We're not going to try to hide anything. So we went through the state on that body yard, and I think they were just as strict as the city would ever be, because uh, they knew people would be looking at it, you know, and we know that people are going to be looking at everything we're doing. Uh, so I think that. There was that kind of thing. And I think also because um, Oregon is so defined by its timber, you know, we're the number one um, uh, producer of wood products. I don't know if that's true anymore, but I think it is uh, in the United States. And, and it's sort of, you know, people say you bleed sawdust, you know. So that at every level of uh, the kind of political spectrum, the, the, the business spectrum, you have that. I mean, Senator Merkley's father worked in a sawmill. So we have all that kind of there. So I don't know, hopefully that kind of answers your question. But tenacity, I would say. Nice, nice tenacity is, is important. So it's seismic testing and all that. I know you're interested in earthquakes. But being from Florida, you know, I'm not really too concerned about an earthquake, but a hurricane yeah. would be. Uh, so I wonder if this would transfer uh, this rocking technology in like a hurricane with a straight force wind. Uh, and also the, the rock is just, you know, in the south, you lay a piece of wood down and like a weed is rocking. Yeah. So. No, I think, I, you know, it's like, I hope, I'm glad there are other people with more experience than we do to kind of address some of those issues. But I, I think that, um, I, I haven't really thought about the, um, uh, you know, rocking wall relative to hurricanes is an interesting question, you know, in terms of, because actually, really, wind governs on high rises, and if you're, you know, in terms of the load. So really, we're, we're, the loads are higher for the wind up top relative to our building than the seismic. So it's, the, the seismic is more of a performance-based issue of when the, when the earth rocks, the thing can return to center. I don't know, um, in a way, the wind is kind of maybe challenging for us relative to the rocking wall system because you don't want it to rock when it's really windy out. You see what I'm saying? So, so it's sort of I don't know. I'm I'd have to. That's a good question. I have to go back to our structural engineers and ask. <laughs> so you stumped me on that one. There are people looking. Yeah. Beginning to look. But in the back or yeah. Yeah. So I'm curious. Uh, so what's on your horizon? Where do you see uh, this going, and what are the limitations? I think I see it, so just to give you a sense of my week, I started my week in Los Angeles <laughs> um, yesterday, and I was <coughs> meeting with a major or uh, major corporation who's you know, interested in this technology for a building. So that's a big change, you know? And I know of major projects that are happening in the Bay Area by major companies. Um, that are using this technology and really looking into it seriously. Uh, so I know of three or four plants that are either being built or about to be funded on, on the, along the West Coast to manufacture this product. I, I know of a new product called Mass Ply with Panels that we're doing work on. Um, and we just did a structure at the Portland Art Museum and they're building like a three acre plant right outside of, of uh, Oregon, I mean, right south of Portland, it's an exciting technology that would compete with us. I have friends that are building 
clients in Canada. I mean, there's a lot going on that is probably not as apparent maybe on the East Coast. Um, I've, you know, I'm actually, tomorrow I'm going to, to this evening, I'm going to Atlanta to meet with folks at Auburn, and there's a new um, plant actually going in that's basically funded by a Canadian laminator. They're building a CLT plant there. And then on Friday, I'm going to New York where they're having a lecture on tall timber cities at the Architectural Center. So it's, there's a lot happening. Um, and I could go on for a longer, but I'm, I think I should ask if somebody else has a question. You have a question right there. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you have any numbers on carbon storage possibility similar Yeah, we're doing actually with um, the Forest Service, actually, we're part of a life cycle analysis that um, we're excited. Um, and, it's, uh, and we're actually doing a true life cycle analysis on this building and comparable buildings and other materials to really look at it. But the reality is you can't really do a true life cycle analysis until the thing's built and you really know what all the pieces are and then the rest becomes more theoretical. But you know, you're, you know the, in terms of carbon sequestration, like the framework building is like the equivalent of taking like um, 400 cars off the road. So it's pretty, I mean, but I, I always temper that because there's many different ways you can do that carbon life cycle. So we'll try to be conservative on that. We are definitely com promoting it. It's just, um, and I didn't really address it, but it is a huge, it's obviously a huge piece of it. I mean, I think just being from Portland, we had huge forest fires <coughs> the last couple of months and you're just like, we have ash raining down our house. And you're like, well, this is crazy that this is actually happening. Um, and I think that part of it is people within cities, like architects, uh, trying to kind of explain to people that forest management is actually more sustainable than just letting forests just sit and collect fuel. And I think that's the big hurdle. But I think there's definitely of the sophisticated people in the um, environmental community in Portland, you're seeing a major shift where people are starting to actually <coughs> see the importance. And we have organizations like EcoTrust in Portland that actually own significant chunks of forest that they're managing themselves. So that's a big change too. Mm -hmm. so, that's yeah. You had a photo of a yeah. stairwell that you described as a fire. Yeah, I kind of make that. Yeah, it's it actually is a fire stair. Um, and it's completely, you know, enclosed and encapsulated with an hour rate of partition. But the way our building works, it's an L-shaped lot, and we wanted one of the stairs to be um, opening out into the courtyard. So that's that stair. It's sort of, it's a like a nice fire stair. <laughs> yeah, they're all shut, and there's like, the windows open to the to the outside. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's just a. It is, but it is actually. There's two fire stairs in the building, and that's the one open one with the shutters on it. I don't know if I should take more questions. Would you say that it would be easier to meet some of the seismic standards with this kind of material? I think, I mean, we're trying to go beyond the standard to create a resilient building. So that's so the, the seismic standard is that. When you have an earthquake, the thing doesn't fall down. <coughs> That's the standard. What we're trying to do is create, use the fact that wood has a very high strength to weight ratio to actually create a more resilient structure. It's, it's the equivalent of, I'd say, at Albany Yard, we tried to make the expression of the thing, the cantilever. The expression of framework is its ability. It's kind of rock, and then it's sort of strong core, like an old growth timber, I mean, like an old growth tree. Uh, you know, our high rises, I mean, we've had the seismic stuff in the code for a while, so we should be okay. It's the issue of, of you'll have a lot of buildings like that, or, <laughs> you know, or, you know, a lot of concrete, just, you know, it, nobody, you, you, no, you pretty much have to tear those down, because people just don't want to work on a tilted floor. That's what happened in Christchurch, if people are aware of the earthquakes there, is, that's one of the reasons that technology, this technology has been adapted there as well. Um, and a lot of research that's been done there on 